Welcome, good morning. This is a talk improving your web app through UI UX best practices. My name is Michael Geik, and I'm leading a team of UI designers in our professional services division. I'm here with Al. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yes, hi, my name is Al Lafranboise. I work for the developer experience uh, team at Esri. So if you've gone to ArcGIS for developers, then that's the kind of work that I do. And uh, I guess there's a question I had. I'm just curious who we have in the audience. How many people uh, would say they're sort of dedicated designers? Just a show of hands, please. A couple folks. Uh, what about developers? Mostly everyone else. Okay, who's wearing both hats? <laughs> okay. So, and that's the challenge, right? Um, so hopefully we have some uh, tips and tricks today to help everyone out and uh, we have some real world scenarios too. So I'll pass it back to Mike. So what are you, you're a designer, developer or both? Oh, I would say I'm both, uh, trying really hard at design, um, forced to do development and for many years and uh, just trying to do better every day. All right, excellent, well that's good to hear. Uh, so. Um, we as a team in professional services, we work on approximately 50 projects, products a year. So over the years, I've been with Esri for over 16 years, I've seen lots of different applications coming through my hands. So I'm really hoping to share some of the experience with you today. Um, what I'm going to do is first I will talk about uh, UI UX. Um, I will give you a framework and uh, we'll show you how you in your current process will fit into it and maybe hopefully uh, learn something and um, do things uh, maybe slightly differently. Um, secondly, I will show you uh, best practices. We call them map UI patterns that talk about how the pieces um, that make up this application will fit together. And then uh, finally, Al and I, we're going to show you some of the um, work that we are doing. Um, for my part, I show you a sneak peek and research insights into ArcGIS indoors. And Al will talk about the vector tile a style editor. So how about we add easy to use to the list, shall we? Let's try it. Okay, um, let me give you an example of what I mean here. Um, this is an application that halfway through the budget and feature complete was given to me with the, with the task to beautify it, you know, pep it up, make it look nice, make it look sexy. So do you see anything wrong with this application? Uh, can I put you on the spot? Is there anything, do, do you see this? Oh, no, it looks wonderful. Um... Yeah, you have a window, you have a solid starting point, and it uh, looks like it's ready to go. It is, huh? No, that's the developer side of things, right? So, well, it's feature complete. So we could say we are done, right? Um, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's slightly different, right? Like bringing a broken application um, to a car wash doesn't make it clean. So. Let's, let's uh, see what are the things that are missing here. Obviously, we don't even know what this application uh, is about, right? There's no title, there's no tagline. Um, there's this, this weird menu on the side that is really um, unconventional and unfamiliar to most people. Um, so we have to guess and we ha almost have to poke or stick between the menu items to find out what's, what's hidden behind. Then there are three types of searches. And then there's this huge map that I don't even know why it's there in the first place, right? So um, what did we do? Uh, we went back to the drawing board. We pulled out all the pieces from the menus. We laid them out slightly different. And as you can see, now you actually see what this application is about. Another big piece that you can see here is uh, that the map became auxiliary to the application. So it's not the main focus anymore. Um, it actually um, has now the affordance to be clicked on, so it engages the users even more. But there's still a problem with the map. I don't know if you realize, but um, the space around the Pacific Ocean and, and Canada is really wasted space for the purpose of our application because um, we are talking about representatives in the United States, right? So um, we engaged with our cartography lab and they came up with an even better map, I find. So let's try to trace back what the problem of such a poor design could have been. 
I mean, we all know that the goal of software development is to ship something, right? But we should not fall trap into forgetting about all the things that come beforehand. There's a definition of what needs to be built and everything hopefully starts with a problem. So in our case, what happened was that, and it happens actually many times, is that a project manager goes out to the client, um, does requirements gathering, and then they come back with the requirements, and you see the air quotes I'm making, um, and dump those requirements on the developer's desk and say, do it, right? And they say, oh yeah, 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 let me go out and let me find some sample code and you know tweak it to my needs and we are done. Um, what they should have done, and that's represented with this diamond here, is to use divergent thinking to explore the solution space first, to discover um, uh, possible ideas, and then eventually converge back into building the right uh, solution. So of all the uh, bullet points I have listed here, I think wireframes is your best friend. The wireframes, they ensure that you build the right thing. It's almost like a contract between you and the client and you know, everybody involved, all the stakeholders. So there's actually a second diamond um, that shows the real challenge, which is to find and confirm the right problem to solve. So in our case, nobody has asked what the problem was to solve, right? Nobody was able to feel empathy with the constituents that simply need to find an email of the address, you know, the email address of the congressperson they're interested in. So what we need to be, we need to be Sherlock Holmes on the hunt for the true experience problem here. And as a matter of fact, omitting this step is the biggest problem that I see. In many cases, we start with the definition and we just go and we don't ask all the questions about the user experience and why we're doing things. So this is the process that we are following in professional services. Um, unfortunately, we see, still see it way too often um, that we get stuck at this definition phase where um, um, a client, be it internal or external, comes to us and tells us what they think they need and we try to match it up with Esri technologies. Like they, they come to us and say, you know, we need to go out in the field and collect something. And we say, oh, yeah, perfect, collector, right? So uh, somebody says, you know, I think we need to build um, applications. Oh, web builder. Uh, we need to put out stuff so that people, the general public, can see it online. Oh, story maps, right? So that doesn't result in a good ex user experience. You actually have to ask, why are we doing it and how should we doing it? Should we be doing it? Not only you know, what. So that's a real challenge here. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about UX strategy and then we dive into UI design and I will show you some of the, the good stuff here. So what are the most important questions to ask? Obviously, we start with who is using it? We call it the end users. So who are the people that come to the site and need something and what do they need? What are the end user needs? And then are they able to accomplish their tasks? Um, it, we call it usability. Um, when we think about end user needs, that's um, asking what is useful to our users and will they accomplish their task, that's the usability. So usefulness is almost more important than usability because if the application isn't useful to anybody, then you don't have to worry about usability anymore. Um, are the users happy? So we call it user experience. Um, that's actually really important because if they are not happy, they won't come back. Um, the first rule of the internet is that most users will spend most of the time somewhere else. So don't think that your site is so important that everybody will come and use it all the time. And you know, if you get it wrong, they not only don't come back, but I've seen that many times, they will actually sabotage you. So this is really important. Um, what are the business needs? And was it successful? What does it mean to be successful? This is actually a really crucial point here because um, if we don't think about success factors or success criteria, um, we never know um, 
when we are successful. It always be um, part of uh, subjective uh, matters of, you know, we think we are successful. Um, I think in our case, in the example that I showed you, we, the developers or the project team probably has thought about their business needs, maybe about the end user needs, but they have not looked at the other things. So answering the question, what is good design is a combination of all those bullets that I'm showing will give you the purpose of why you're doing it. It will give you the meaning of life of your application. So you have to think about all of them. And I want you to remember those questions. I'm going to test you later. So let's talk about UI design. Um, my first recommendation to you is to sketch, and then to sketch, and then to sketch. We have tried to not uh, to basically overpass this step of sketching and dive right into mock-ups because you know the output was a shiny uh, image on a PowerPoint presentation, or maybe do some prototyping with one of those fancy prototyping tools, or go a step right into rapid prototyping, doing like a React um, or something. But we've always come back to wireframes. Um, I would suggest that you um, look out for balsamic, it's a very inexpensive uh, way to um, do wireframes, and we never ever go beyond the, um, the wireframes without wireframes. Um, here's a link to a design lab that Al has put together a couple of years back um, that will uh, show you the principle of designs. We'll give you all the good stuff of you know, how to do alignment, visual hierarchy, consistency, white space, balance, unity, so those are the things um, that you look at once, um, um, uh, you know, put it uh, into your tool set and move on. And then finally, um, I encourage you to check out mapuipatterns.com uh, that describes proven solutions to common design problems, which will really help you to reinvent the wheel over and over again. And those are the best practices, which I'm going to talk about next. Uh, let's talk about them in more details. Uh, on this site, mapuipatterns.com are currently 57 UI patterns. Um, full disclaimer, um, I have created them, I've collected them, I'm creating them. Um, so this site is, is maintained by yours truly. I've invested lots of time and effort over the last couple of years to build this up, so please, if you see anything that is missing, let me know, uh, plop a comment into the forum, and help me to spread the word. As you can see, it uh, covers lots of sections like general UX, layouts, special workflows, how to navigate the map, interact with content, deal with complex data, all the things that you probably uh, encounter on a daily basis. So let's talk about another problem and I will show you how we actually solve this problem, or this design challenge, uh, using map UI patterns. Um, let's work through this exercise. Uh, do, when you look at this um, design, do you see anything wrong with this site? Does it look ugly? Busy? I, I can say it, we've built that, so that's fine. Um, Al, what would you say? <laughs> I'll put you on spot again. I, I can't give it away. I mean, it looks looks uh, very busy, as you say. Um, lots of information. Okay. Well, before we um, rush to judgments, um, okay, here's the test. What's the first question we have to ask? Who is it for? What is it supposed to do? What else? Are the users able to accomplish their tasks? Are the users happy? Do we meet the business needs? Was it successful? So who is it for? It was for the general public. No, actually it was not for the general public. That's what the client told us, but it's, um, whenever somebody tells me this is for the general public, I ask you, so I don't think my, my mom would use that. So maybe it's not for the general public. So who is it for? We have to, we can do better, I think. Um, well, it is for, potential applicants to food programs um, of the USDA that want to explore existing programs and programs of their partners, and then potentially sign up. Okay, so that's more interesting. Um, let's, before we actually go into um, the, the redesign effort, uh, 
let me point out a couple of things that are obviously wrong here. So obviously there's you know a huge logo in a top real estate uh, space in the top left corner, um, which is really not needed. Then there's lots of text, and we know that people on the internet don't read, so this is really wasted space too. And I don't know if you can read it, but it says something about if there are multiple projects in the same zip code, they will show up on the same pin. You can scroll through, through them. So, <laughs> so I, I always say um, uh, user interface is like a joke. If you have to explain it, then it's not that good. So maybe we shouldn't even have to explain it here. Then we have a base map gallery. In my opinion, a base map gallery base map galleries need to die. There's really no reason to have base map galleries if we as the author of the map don't know which base map is the best, best base map for our operational data, then our users won't either. Uh, we do have three types of searches, highly confusing. Um, then we have a map that is that is truly busy. And that's actually one of the pain points that our client told, told us up front. They said the map is a, fi a fire hose of data. I call it a tsunami of data, but hey. Um, and then there's this huge layer list of something that looks like um, ArcMap on the web. So why would anybody, anybody ever be able to know how to use this app? Be because we're smart, right? Um, yes, we are all smart, but I think we can do better. So first, what have we done? This is the old version, now side by side with the new version. What we have done is um, we removed the logo, we were able to reduce the text, but we got pushback, so we still had to include something. And uh, the next obvious change was the base map. Uh, we, uh, we, we removed the base map gallery. Um, we used the following patterns. We've used a thematic map pattern that deals with too much data on a map. Um, so the initial extent of the United States will show you where the um, accumulations of data are, but only after selecting something on a map, and it's easy to select the state, the map will zoom to the state and will start showing the actual data. We uh, use the unified search pattern to combine the search and the locator, so that's more the experience that you would expect from something like uh, Google, and that's what you're used to. Um, we added a locate me to allow users to conveniently show the area of interest. Um, we uh, added a clear call to action button that reads explore funding. So that's, uh, that m helps uh, meeting the business needs from the client. Uh, we used browse geographies to allow users to easily select uh, an alternative means of selecting their, their state instead of the map. And if they want to become even more specific, they can click on feature selection, which allows them to um, hand draw a little polygon and select points. And then as soon as they make the selection, um, the browse geography list um, gets removed and replaced by a table, so they can actually see um, those projects. Um, then we have a home button in case they get lost and they need to reset and start over. And we added place marks to represent all the territories and states that we couldn't show here because, I mean, we don't want to show the initial extent of the world um, just to um, cover Guam and Puerto Rico. Well, so were we successful? Well, we did usability testing when we found out that we weren't quite there. So we did a uh, version two. And um, what we did here is, first of all, we improved the look. We lightened the background. Um, you see all the buttons, they blend into the background, and we kept the main um, button, which is Explore Funding, um, dark blue. Uh, we removed the intro text, finally, and um, we listened to our users that said, well, we didn't understand the map. What is the map about, right? Well, so there's a legend behind the buttons, as you see in version one, but people didn't know, right? So yeah, we pulled it out, made it Im immediately visible in this little side panel, um, and the same with layers. And we actually we combined the layer list with a little dashboard so they could see, um, okay, there are over 6,000 meat processors. Maybe I should turn on this layer. So there are other common problems that um, can be solved by map UI patterns. Unfortunately, you know, the, um, we don't have enough time in this session to talk about them, but very common problems are too much data, 
Um, uh, some of the patterns that solve this problem is the thematic map, uh, which I showed you right now, attribute filter, spatial filter. And then um, questions I get many times is how the application, like a side panel, should interact with the map. So there is a pattern called marker list, there's list and details, extent driven contest, um, and store locator. And so, but let's dive into layouts a little bit. Um, that's, uh, I think, something that uh, I hear uh, developers struggling a lot with. So, one of the layouts is full map, where the map is the focus and the core value. And it's really most effective when combined with the unified search that leads into other tasks. Uh, so, another pattern um, that we use many times is what we call search and edit, where people search for something and then what they find, they can immediately edit. This partial map design um, is something that I recommend for most applications. We use it uh, many times. The example I'm showing here is from Guy Carpenter. That's a large reinsurance company. That's a company, it's an insurance company that insurance, uh, insures insurance companies. Um, and so this has a clear top to bottom flow. So the users would first select a group and the portfolio they want to work on, that's in the header. Then underneath in this gray bar, they can apply filters to reduce the amount of locations. And then from left to right, they select the um, type of workflow they want to work on, like underwriting events, hazards, accumulation, um, and then work through the workflow um, that is accompanied by the map. So there's a back and forth. The reference map um, you've seen before, it's uh, great for navigation purposes and it's mostly only used for orientation. Um, it has limited interactions and it's really only auxiliary to the content. Yes, there's a no map layout. Um, I don't know if I should say that working at ASRI, but it is okay to not put a map on your interface. And here's the example of community maps that we've done a while back. It uses reviewer server, another GIS technology to check and report the quality of the uploaded data. And um, so just because you don't have a map doesn't mean that we cannot use the full power of GIS. And it doesn't mean that we cannot get to a map if we need it. So there are two links that actually takes you to the map and visualizes it. So that also shows you that you can change layouts depending on your needs. Another example of how to change layouts is uh, what we call focus on the subject. That allows you to toggle between full map and reference map. So here's the example of the Hawaii Department of um, Education. It's a dashboard where you can search for uh, facilities like schools and see um, in a mini dashboard uh, the output. And then when you select the school and click on show details, we toggle from what we currently have uh, full map to a reference map. So now you see additional data, and the focus is really on the data, but you see this little uh, map of the school boundary, just to give you an idea of what this is about. Uh, lastly, there's uh, what we call mobile. Again, I could probably talk about this uh, a lot, and I will show you a little animation here. Um, we have a list, and you know, selecting an item from the list goes to the details, and on the details we have um, a reference map, and it it's not active, right? So, but only after clicking on the map, the map toggles into full map mode, and now the map is active. So the reason why the map originally was not active is because on mobile devices, uh, many cases you fall into this trap of you try to scroll down and suddenly you touch the map, and instead of scrolling, you actually pan the map. So that's how we acti activate the map and move on. So, um, so that's it for patterns. I encourage you to have a look at uh, mapuipatterns.com. Let me know if there's anything missing. The next topic is really interesting. It's about ArcGIS indoors. I'm sure you've heard a lot about indoors. There's lots of um, hype about it. I want to present you uh, the findings from a user study we have done, and I want to talk a little bit about 3D and um, uh, I will give you a, a exclusive sneak peek into what is coming in later versions. Uh, everything started as project wear, right? That was like a year ago. Um, we did th um, indoor pro uh, projects for companies, and we've done it once, twice, three times until we eventually realized, you know what? Actually, this should become a product. Um, it should not be 
necessarily uh, uh, driven by the requirements of, of clients, but by a combination of the um, user needs and business needs. So we had this, the luxury of having an international intern during the summer. Um, his name was René Unrau from uh, Esri, Germany, and he was working on his PhD thesis on improving map interfaces. And the idea was to use indoors to log user behavior and visualize these traces to detect patterns and anomalies. So our objectives um, were to ask, is the map always the best approach? Are there alternatives? And does it make a difference whether users, um, when users are more familiar with the environment they're navigating and whether um, they're uh, more familiar with GIS and technology? So what we did is we added event listeners on every possible user interaction on and around the map. And we blasted out an email to all the Azure employees, not all of them, some of them, and the interns and asked them to participate in this study. So we ran that remotely. Um, we asked the participants to um, answer some questions up front, um, whether how experienced they are in GIS and how good their mental map of the Azure campus is. And, and then we presented them with, with a task. And then as soon as they uh, started using the task, we would measure the task time. Um, the first task was a very basic save your office as the home location. And there's actually three ways of doing that, right? First is um, use the search to find your office. Second, use the explore panel on the site to browse the points of interest and find your office and lastly, to use the map. So our stipulation was that the search would be the primary means for this task. But um, so what we did is we uh, collected the data, we stored it in Elasticsearch, and we used Kibana dashboards to uh, visualize it. And you can see on the, on the y-axis the anonymized users, and along the x-axis the user interactions by time elapsed in seconds. So all these little bubbles along the, the line are those events that users uh, uh, clicked on, that they clicked on something. Um, and then we visualized it as a user flow um, that helped us to represent and understand the different pathways the users would take through the application and to find potential problems here. And you can see on the left-hand side, this blue stripe is when users started the task. On the right-hand side, this light reddish Stripe is when they told us that they were done with the task. Um, one thing that you can see here is that like those red stripes towards the, the center and towards the right, and that's actually when they clicked on feature home. So that's when they um, saved their home location, and that's what we wanted them to do. But you can see some of the users that clicked on home clicked on home again, there's another red stripe, and then again, and then again, and we actually saw that <laughs> this list continued. They clicked like seven or eight times, which showed us that maybe we didn't give them any feedback that something happened, right? So they saved it seven times. Um, the interesting part here was that 80% of the users used the map for this task. Only 13% used the search, which we thought would be the, the, the main attraction here. And so what we did next was um, we did uh, A-B testing. So um, we showed half the users an initial extent of the campus, and then the other half of the users, they would see an initial extent of building Q, which is our headquarter in Redlands. And then we wanted to see how they navigate. So people that saw the, uh, the campus by default uh, and were familiar would zoom in, everybody else would zoom in and pan. So yes, we expected they would have to zoom in, right? Um, only the ones that were familiar with the campus would zoom in immediately to the point um, of interest they were interested in, um, which means to us that maybe the signifiers on the map, the targets they can uh, click on weren't clear enough or maybe there's something we can do to help users to maybe um, zoom in without having to pan. Um, very interesting was the behavior on uh, the user group that saw building Q. Um, we saw that 
the people that were familiar with the campus would immediately pan to the office location while everybody else would first zoom out and then pan. So visualizing this in a 3D space, so panning would be along the X and Y axis and zooming would be along the C axis. So you can see on the left hand side, people that were familiar with the campus would zoom way less um, while people less familiar with the campus would zoom um, a lot. So there's lots more map interactions, which again to us means maybe there's something we can do to help people that are less familiar um, to uh, not having to zoom out and in constantly. Maybe we add little um, markers on a site that point to points of interest like, oh, over there, there's the cafe, right? Click on it and we take you there. Or maybe add some constraints. The next step was to retrieve step-by-step -step instructions from the cafe to Mike Geig's office. And here, uh, it was uh, reversed to our first task. The majority of people use, did not use the map. So actually half of the people used the direction sidebar um, and 36% of the users used the um, panel on the site. And of the users that used the map, um, all of them told us that they were either very familiar with the campus or very familiar with GIS. So the big takeaway here is that um, task-focused workflows are extremely helpful for more difficult tasks. And um, typing in the source and de destination is a really convenient way for users to do so. Another really interesting insight was 3D. Um, zero percent of users use 3D. Or in other words, 100% of users did not use 3D. And we had 85 users, just to show you that it wasn't five or six. Um, so in essence, users did not make use of 3D, which to me it means that either they were happy with 2D for the tasks that they had to accomplish, or they just did not see the option to toggle to 3D. I don't know if you see it, but there's like a little button, right? Um, which means it's, it's poor design. So. Um, I took that back to the product team and I asked them um, to do something about it. And their response was, okay, no problem. Um, take an iteration and do your thing. So um, I went out and I asked more questions um, and mostly, why do we need 3D? So I talked with the practice lead and uh, had a really anim animated discussion. Um, I asked why many times and after two hours he gave me the boot and on the way out, he, he shouted, it's a beep, 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 must. Uh, he didn't say it that way, but I, I got the message. So no discussion, right? So 3D has to be in. So next, I talked to the 3D team at ESRI, and I thought, like, if somebody knows, then it's them, right? Let me talk with them. And their response was, what? You still do 2D? You're so yesterday. Um, and I understand where they're coming from, because um, the clients they are dealing with is smart cities, companies with 100,000 people and more, right? And they only have 3D, they have Revit BIM data, they don't want to go back to 2D. Um, and then I talked to clients and, I mean, not surprisingly, I mean, they are happy to get the PDF maps um, uh, into 2D. And they say, we don't know what is 3D and how to maintain this. So the challenge here was, well, we need 3D. Um, understand the problem to the solution. We have the solution, but why? I still don't know. So in those cases, what I do is, and this is the designer's best kept secret, we call it back, steal or borrow, we get inspiration. So I went out and I looked out, uh, for, for example, how games do it. Um, they have done that for years, um, that uh, players navigate complex 2D worlds with a uh, 3D worlds with a 2 mi 2D minimap orientation. Um, and you know what? Even Google does it. And uh, now you're telling me, oh, Google, oh, bad boy, bad boy, don't mention that word. Um, you know, what it means to me if Google does it, uh, it means to me two things. So either Google has done their homework and they know that this is how people behave and that's what they want and we should learn from it, or because Google does it, soon everybody will do it, and we should learn from it. So it's actually, you know, probably a good, good pattern. So here's the exclusive sneak peek 
of the mini-maps that we are currently testing, that we hopefully uh, implement in, in a future version of indoors. Um, it combines the best uh, of both worlds. As you can see, there's the, the route that shows the route from my office to the cafe. Um, maybe people don't understand that the dashed line means that we are on the second, that we're on the first floor, but that the route goes to the second floor. But looking at the 3D map, they would understand that. Um, uh, 2D does not give you elevation, but it shows you the full route. In 3D, um, it gives you more confidence that what you're looking at is the real thing, but stuff gets hidden. So maybe you can toggle to 3D and you see something. Um, what we are trying to do is we try to keep experience in, in sync as much as possible. And we also want to build in something that informs users um, when the current view has limitations, like um, editing in 3D is really difficult, uh, maybe the other view is better, uh, maybe things that uh, are stacked on top, like floors, uh, better to visualize in 3D, maybe you should go through 3D. So in uh, conclusion, I think the key takeaways are that UX and UI cannot be afterthoughts. You have to um, build that into your workflows. You have to think about the users um, before you start implementing, ask why, why, why. Then sketch, sketch, sketch. Right, do your wireframes, ask who is using it, what do they want to do, was it successful, and use map UI patterns. Those are the best practices that really make your life easier. And uh, now I will turn over to Al, who is going to give you another demo. Okay, thanks, uh, Michael, for that uh, background. So just so you know, all of my slides are in slides.com uh, slash elaframboise. So feel free to follow along there or reference them uh, as we go. So we're going to conclude with a, with a story. So a few years ago, we came out with the vector base maps, uh, vector tile base maps, and everybody wanted to style them out of the gates, and which is fair because that's one of the main advantages. So there were a few people at Esri that kind of jumped on board. So first of all, um, you could actually do this right at the release of the product in 2015. There's 13 short steps you could go through and load the vector tile base map into the map viewer, and then you could copy and save it, and then you could go to your content and download the JSON, and then about uh, 10,000 lines of JSON you could change and manipulate, re-upload to change the actual layer, and then go back to your map viewer, add the vector tile layer, because it's actually a layer, not a base map, and then promote it to a base map, and then finally you would be done. So I call it in just 13 short steps, uh, it was possible. So well, why, why change it? Was, it? was it even broken? So that's kind of was the first iteration, and then our good friend Rene Rublikov came around and said, you know, we can fix this. Um, and so I call this the JSON and Go design. And basically here, he split the design in, in half and said, all right, we, wanna, we want people, we wanna expose the JSON so people can make changes and edits. So um, up top, you can see we have some, some danger buttons, okay? The, the color I'm sure is obvious. Um, and then we have a search, but the search actually will only result in finding hex values. So it was definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, one piece that's missing, if you go to um, the link here, his website says you actually have to go and copy one of the existing Esri vector tile base maps first before you can even start this application. So you needed the copy already ready to go in your account. So it was kind of a, a tricky process, but hats off to to Rene for trying and, and thanks for the tool. And you know what, for most of the developers that were out there um, that were very close to the specification, that tool got the job done. It actually worked. So to say it didn't work wouldn't be fair. It actually did work. But then more people started to get interested in styling the vector tile base maps. And our good friend John Grayson from the application prototype lab built this uh, application. It was just a little bit after Renee's. So um, it was kind of cool, but we could take into consideration some things like white space, right? How well was the white space used? 
And you know, here this solved the problem of selecting a current base map. So you could pick one of the existing ESRI base maps, which was nice. Um, the map is very minimized. It's, it's down in the corner, so it's maybe not that important or not important at this point in time. Um, what was important were the layers. For, for some reason, we need to show everybody all of the layers at once. And just so you know, um, vector tile base maps have uh, up to 500 different layers to style. So it could be quite a daunting task. So he also built in this search, which I think was a huge improvement. Uh, it allowed us to do some filtering. We could put in keywords and we could also find by color. Um, so I think this was great. This was definitely, you know, a move in the right direction. But where I see the big fail sticker come out is where we exposed the JSON again back to the user. It's like, why are we exposing the specification to a potential designer who's gonna use this tool who doesn't really care about the specification? They wanna color roads and streets and so forth. So just something to think about. Uh, I also call it the get out of jail free card. When you expose the JSON, you're basically saying, I couldn't figure out how to design that part of the application. So it's something for us to kind of take home and think about. Okay, so the team that I'm on, um, the developer experience team had an opportunity to build something else. So we took a step back. And like Michael was saying, we wanted to find out who was using the application. So we came up with kind of two broad sets of users and we actually took steps to, to interview them. So the first set of user were the hardcore cartographic people. Um, and those were living real people at Esri that we interviewed and we asked them, hey, what do you guys wanna do? And they said, we wanna do everything. We wanna style highway shields. We want like the width of the boundaries of the roads. We want all of that very fine grained detail and control. And then we knew there was another set of users that had you know, evolved over time, and those were the designers from companies like Nike and so forth, who basically have three brand colors, and they wanna come in and brand a base map. They just wanna get it done. So the common thing that both user groups had was they wanted to do it fast, easy, and they wanted it to be simple. So we took a look at what else was out there, did a little bit of research to see how other styling applications were working, and then we kind of did an iteration on some of the, and some brainstorming on the design challenges that we had. So right out of the gates, we're talking about like a very complex specification. If you look at the JSON spec, it's incre incredibly complicated. And then on top of that, the layers, like how do you deal with 500 layers that aren't really well named and they're very cryptic and so forth? Um, but we wanted to make it fast and easy, and we wanted to make it fast and easy for everyone, the advanced cartographer who wanted fine grain control, as well as the designer. Uh, we wanted to expose full power for the power users, or full control for the power users. And then we wanted to do everything not to, J to expose the JSON, because to us, that was you know, the, the get out of jail free card that we didn't want to play. And my personal goal was to build the system so that you could actually brand a base map in three steps. And given these challenges, it was incredibly difficult. So you've seen this on the main stage, you may have already used this tool, um, but I'll step you through uh, a little bit of the design here. So we basically, one of the standard and most typical designs that you're seeing out now is this sort of vertical toolbar on web applications, especially when there are workflows and tasks involved. So we basically adopted that with a panel that has some very obvious next controls. The map we want it to be very obvious because the color and the colorization and, and, and the visualization was very, very important. And it was important right from the get-go. And then sort of lastly was some of the fine-grained tools that you could use to manipulate your workflow. So when we look at it, Basically, there's like a top left to bottom right workflow from the app. So we had this vision as we were designing the UI right from the very beginning. And when we do usability studies and human behavioral studies, we'll see that this is a very common workflow. So um, let's spend just a few minutes showing you what we came up with and why. So if you log into ArcGIS for developers and go to your dashboard, you can access the vector tile style editor through new base map style. So let's see if we can actually get this done in three steps. 
So the first challenge was to classify all of the different base maps out there. So, and, and we didn't want to have to tell people that, oh, by the way, you're not starting from a clean, you know, um, empty text file. You're starting from a, a JSON structure that already exists. So you'd pick the base map that most closely applied or looked like something that you might want to use. So the first tool that we open and start is our quick editor. And if we just want to explore, then we give people the opportunity uh, to use this randomization tool, just kind of throwing out ideas at people if they didn't really know where to start. But most people do know where to start. They come in, and Mike even told me this too, I have some colors and I want to be able to brand this thing quickly. I was like, okay. So we can do a custom color theme and we actually applied, if you've used like Adobe's color wheel and so forth, um, the, the, we applied some different algorithms here. So you could do like triadic and, and, and analogous and so forth. But most people want to pick a color to start from. So we'll just pick something that's fairly neutral here, like a yellow. And then they want to start to dig in and make their, their design more specific. So we'll fine tune the LAN. And what you're looking at here was an incredible amount of engineering that went into building just this color picker tool. Um, I won't get into all of the details, but there's a lot of smart sort of algorithms being used here to present you with the map colors that are in your design. So you can see at a glance the other greens and so forth that are used. And then you can see other tints and shades that we recommend that are either complementary colors and so forth. So there, there's just a ton of stuff in here we don't have time to, to get into. But um, we tried to make this as useful as possible. And, you know, we give people a typical done button, but you don't need to use it. You can just click on the next item and then that thing just goes away. So we're trying to reduce the number of clicks uh, everywhere. So we'll change the roads a little bit, uh, maybe to darker color, the boundaries will lighten up. And buildings, we'll leave brown, and then nature, maybe we'll just offset this, make it a slightly lighter green. All right, so we're basically, we could be done at this point, um, but if we zoom in a little bit, people start to get picky, and we want to expose some of the label controls. And there, like I said, there's f up to 500 different layers to control here. So we'll just darken the color a little bit. And what a lot of cartographers wanted to do right away was change the uh, fonts. So we'll give you that ability. And we're only giving you a subset of the functionality that's available. So I can make the labels a little bit larger, and we're making them larger everywhere, so everything has to be scaled using a whole bunch of cartographic algorithms that uh, we're not gonna talk about today. Uh, and if I want, I can make the roads narrower. But these were the primary tasks that people wanted to do. And that's it. We could go save as, I could save this, and I'll, I'll just save it out here. And you could share it with your friends if you wanted to. And that was our third step. So basically, in three steps, you can come in, grab a base map, style it, save it, and be done. But, of course, we have the cartographer group who came along and said, well, what if I'm interested in building like a parks map? So if I want to go to Yosemite, um, here are the colors I'm looking at. So you can see something changed over here. We basically have dropped down to the next tool. So we're, we have this sort of linear approach. This is the next most complex tool potentially. So I can touch everything. And you notice in the last exercise, I didn't touch anything on the map. Now I'm actually touching the map. I'm interacting with everything I touch, even in these mini windows down here, um, will basically be expanded and brought to your attention in this tree view. So we have this very complex categorization system where we translate non-real world, <laughs> I'd call them layer names, to real layer names that people can understand. So um, let's go back over here and we'll touch, let's say we want to just enhance the admin. But here's the cool part. We came up with a secret grouping sort of algorithm where you could select a higher level grouping. We would grab all of these layers you could expand them and see them if you want. And we'd find the common properties for each one. So we could change uh, their color if we wanted to, all in one fell swoop. So we're changing many layers and we don't even really know them unless we go in and evaluate them. And you might not be interested in them, you just want, I want everything that's a park or has the terminology is associated with forestry to have that color. 
So, I mean, it, it just goes on and on. So here I've selected uh, forest labels. Um, and if we scroll down, we see we can get into like actually positioning labels. Um, so we have these like little icons that we use here to show you to position center, left, right, or top or bottom. So this is where the, the more advanced cartographer would get into, and it's at the bottom for a reason, right? And it's scrollable. But I mean, these are all of the properties. This is just for labeling. Um, it becomes exponentially more complex as we move through. Um, then some other people wanted to just color things by selecting a color and replace. So this next tool in this sort of linear toolbar says, all right, uh, allows you to pick all of the blues and you don't really care where they are. You're just like, I want these blues to be a different color, a different color of blue as an example. So I'm gonna select a different color. I'm gonna apply it to everywhere. Now all of our oceans and streams and lakes and everything have been colorized at the same time. Um, and then for the power users, we actually give you the ability to drag and drop highway shields on here so you, and, and different patterns that you can use as fill patterns. This was also a request that came from the advanced cartographers. They wanted you know, swamps to look like swamps and maybe different swamps. So you, you can actually upload your own um, JPEGs and, and PNGs here to accomplish that. And then, uh, of course, the other handy tools like Reset so I could go back and I could reset the style. I can undo, uh, I can move forward again because like a lot of people would come in and they'd go to the editor and they'd randomize and the colors would be applied and like, oh, I lost my design. Well, again, part of usability and, and building good UI is giving people the tools to fix the problems they might run into or, or some of the mistakes they might make. So we can actually reset. Uh, the entire design back or, or undo and move forward and back. Um, and then down a little further, we have the leave uh, feedback on GeoNet, and that's basically a way for us to get feedback on the application. So uh, without further ado, uh, was this application successful? Uh, we, we think it was, it was fairly successful. Um, we definitely had some enhancement requests. Uh, one of them is, and the one we continually get, is when is it going to be released with the portal? Um, and that's coming, so very soon, if you have your own portal, then you'll have the vector tile style editor, so you'll be able to do that for your own organization. Um, performance, we're continually working on to make it faster to style and, and uh, a little quicker to redraw. Um, and internationalization was another one. So that's another one that was coming. We just didn't have time to build it all in. Um, but otherwise, we have that feedback mechanism and I encourage you to test drive the application and, and critique it and, and give us feedback. Um, for, for us, it was, it was extremely, um, the bar was very, very high. Having two types of users to be able to, um, to, to make useful, to make an application useful for them and then to make the power users successful as well as the designers. So that's what we came up with. So I wanted to share that design exercise with you. Hopefully uh, there were some good tips and tricks there. Of course, please give us some feedback uh, on the survey. And I think we have a, just a couple of minutes left for questions. Yeah, and I mean, what I want to add here, if I, if I may, um, I think you did an excellent job because uh, what we need to do, uh, so what we have to be as designers is we have to be magicians, right? We have to be able to pull this rabbit out of the hat and give this impression that this is really happening um, without putting all the burden on the users. And I think you, you truly pulled this rabbit out of his head because, I mean, people maybe don't understand that there's like 500 layers that you have to style on the fly and you have to do all this complex magic, but you basically put all the burden on you, the developer, and take it away from the user, and that's why it becomes a great experience. Question. Uh, when you say pull them out, do you mean like hide them? Yeah, just so they, they're not. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's bring that back. So you can pick, uh, if you just select uh, a layer, if you just zoom in a little bit like parks, um, at the top you can make all 
that's actually the first control I should have showed everyone is that's basically how you identify you have the right layer. So you can turn them invisible. If you want, you can change their visible range. So here I've changed the visible range to three, to zoom level three, so you can make it visible longer or shorter. Um, so yeah, those are the top. And again, the most important, the most common tools are at the top, which is what you would expect. So the answer is yes to your question. Yeah. Uh, me, I, I have a of Julia. This may be a thing in there, but the biggest thing, I, I changed my base map. What I did, navigation was basically perfect, but the parks were very, very bright green, and I wanted to make all of them just a little bit less green, like a little more gray. And it, it, just like you showed, with the first tool with that original editor, whatever, I had to go in with every single layer and click it, and it was like, it was finally because I had to get the quad lip rip, the stage parks, the federal parks, the golf courses, you know what I mean? They were all this bright green. Uh, so I had to hunt the tech. What I would like is, let's say I want to change like the color of like just one thing. I mean, the grouping, that's very helpful, like grouping parks or whatever. But I, wa I wanted like an identified, like a uh, eyedropper tool, you know, like in Photoshop to find out, hey, if I click on this thing, what is it? Like if I click on a road or a park, it'll tell you the park layer. Okay, so I, I may have, yeah, so the question is how do you uniquely identify something just by clicking on it? So, yeah, when, when, whenever you, whatever you touch on the map will be expanded um, in the tree view. So, um, yeah, so it, everything is alive and touchable, and it's, and, and again, it depends on the user. Some people run to the map, so here I've touched the road. Um, I can see road highway zero is selected. At this point, I can select all roads and I can style them all at once, or I can just touch that. Uh, in this case, it's the uh, the highway shield, um, and I can style the highway shield and so forth. So yeah, everything you touch is enabled. There's nothing that uh, you know we don't leave that isn't stylable. So what you see is what you get. pretty much. Question. Yeah, so the question is um, whether we were able to find out if making 3D, the default view in indoors would make a difference. And we had lots of discussion about it. Um, uh, the real question is, is 3D the better default? Uh, the, uh, 3D has lots of uh, pitfalls. It's very difficult to navigate. Um, it has distortion. It hides objects um, behind buildings. Um, so 3D might not be the better default. Uh, but yeah, we had lots of discussions about it. Yeah, so the question is how, how did we lock the interactions? And so we did uh, implement custom events in indoors that we were logging to Elasticsearch and we visualized it in Kibana dashboards. So um, we implemented a custom widget that basically hooked up all those events on the map and um, as part of the application itself. And that's what we used to log. Is that something, something we can make available? Maybe. Yes. It's a great question. Um, so yeah, so one of the, the major challenges was uh, with all of the layers uh, available, uh, we worked closely with the cartographic team um, at Esri and we came up with uh, the classification that you see here that basically takes the entire specification, all the different layers, squishes them down into these categories that we felt were the most understandable. Um, and we actually went through a few iterations and we fought basically amongst one another to come up with the six that you see here. Um, the, probably the most contentious one was boundaries because the cartographers wanted boundaries and we didn't want a sixth uh, category. We wanted to try to keep it to five. 
And the smart algorithm here, cartographic algorithm that's being implemented is incredibly complicated because it's colorizing everything that even is related to a boundary, some subcolor of the color that you pick. So, I mean, we did our best. I think um, when you expand the categories, you're gonna see that the categories are a little different depending on uh, the, the complexity of a layer that you load. So if you load um, canvas, gray canvas is an example, you'll see slightly different categorization than you'll find with, uh, with streets. So again, it was a little bit subjective, but we did work with professionals uh, that are, were professional cartographers to help come up with these names. Um, and then we just used it a lot. And hopefully we got it close. And I think you did a great job at keeping the vision intact because it's, it's so easy to fall trap to get more and more requirements in. Because remember when we talked with um, those cartographers and we talked with the people that designed all the Azure base maps and while we were observing them, we saw that they constantly zoomed in and out. And I, I asked them, so why do you constantly zoom in and out? Because you want to see different extents at you know, all different times. And that's why we added those three small maps at the bottom. And they said, no, actually, we want to see the transition between the scales. For us, it's really important when a user zooms in, how does it transition? Does it feel right? So that's, for example, something that um, we consider maybe to build in the future, maybe to generate like a GIF that shows you this tran transition constantly. But uh, obviously, we have to make a, a cut at some point and say, you know, well, maybe that's an extent, ex you know, a function for the really advanced cartographer. Yeah, and, and it just it continually moves on. So what 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 uh, Michael is talking about here is that what see so we're at scale four here and scale three. We're at actually have a zoom for that, um, and we have an actual color defined. As we zoom in, we blend that between three and the color at six, and then we blend it again between five and six, and then six is finally the color that you have, and you can continually. Um, you can add different zoom levels. Like, it's infinitely complex. As you zoom in, the color is actually changing, so we interpolate between the color, uh, the colors that you provide, and that's what Mike is talking about. And, and again, those are super user features, right? You could add as many stops as you want, so the colors could change from blue to green to orange as you zoom into different levels. Uh, but the default behavior is to, trans is to find the translation between the two color values, the hex values. Okay, should we take another question? One uh, more? Last one. One more? So that's a great uh, feedback. So the question was, can 3D help us with these layers? Because these layers all overlap, right? And, and like I said, what I, the tool I use the most is this t the visibility tool to just to concretely identify the layer that I have. But if you want to envision the overlap, that could be a use case where we could do a 45 degree tilt and, and we could feather the layers out. But the, the initial issue that comes to mind is there could be 500 layers in that fanning. Um, they wouldn't all be visible at that one time, like they're not visible at all at one time, but nonetheless, it could be a use case, it would be an interesting usability study. Yep. Yes, v very interesting and, and well taken point. Okay, thank you very much everyone, hopefully that was helpful.